Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, what is for me a bit of a risk um, in, in that I'm going to read some fiction. Uh, maybe it's risky because fiction has never paid me a nickel in my life, um, but though I'd love to write it. Um, and so I have a novel that's just, just going out now, and it's called The Curiosity. And um, I need to give a little history um, of the novel. There is a scientist who has found that um, amoeba that died by rapid freezing still contain within them uh, glycogen, oxygen, and actually everything that they need to live. And if they can be awakened in a kind of primordial soup bath, they can be placed in that bath with a strong magnetic field and a little electricity, they'll actually begin to metabolize for a couple of seconds. Um, and so he builds on this research, and he, start, he moves up to plankton, and eventually to krill, copepods, and shrimp. And he can actually get a shrimp that was frozen rapidly. He can't freeze it himself. He's got to find a frozen shrimp, um, like in, a, in an iceberg. Um, and uh, he, can, he can awaken that shrimp, and it will actually reanimate for a couple minutes at a time. And he is a deeply narcissistic, ambitious, egotistical, selfish man who really wants one thing only, and that's the Nobel Prize for Science for Biology. And so um, the, it's what's in the field referred to as Swede fever. And he has a bad case of it. And he, hired, he has raised a bunch of money, and there is a ship that is in the iceberg lanes about 850 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And this ship is being um, captained by this, this tough guy, Trevor Kulak, but the research arm of it is being run by um, a woman who is uh, a postdoc from Yale cell biologist, considered one of the great young minds for cell research. And they find this iceberg that is, looks like the best find they've ever had of this kind of material that has these frozen things in it. It's got veins and veins going through it. It's like, like striking gold. And at the bottom of one of the veins, there's this large mass of carbon. And they think, whoa, it might be a seal. Or it might be a, an immature narwhal or something like that. And they dive down in this Arctic water. And they carve and carve and carve. And they're, they're going to move, remove a whole specimen entire. But first, they just want to get up to this one extended flipper so they can see what kind of species it is. And when they get up to that flipper, lo and behold, it's not a flipper. It's a human hand. And they bring this body back to their lab in Boston. And over the span of about a year of preparation, they wake them up. And, and the plot of this novel is essentially how our society today responds to the frozen man. And I can tell you that the tabloids love him. And he becomes an internet meme. And the Christian right despises him because there's one resurrection. And there's a man running for president who wants to be photographed with him because it shows the return of American supremacy in the sciences. And in fact, everyone wants to have their products photographed with him because it would be the ultimate endorsement, right? And so he's on the cover of People, that sort of thing. And this scientist very much wants to exploit him. And this woman who found him very much wants to protect him. And eventually, he speaks. And the, the section I'm going to read is a short chapter. <laughs> the first time that he speaks. And this chapter is called The Button. My name is Jeremiah Rice, and I begin to remember. There was a girl. She had fiery hair and ran toward me. I feel her fervent breath on my neck. She liked to dig in my pockets. I would put things there for her to find, a stone, a candle stub, a penny. She had the littlest hands, and her name was, her name was, it will come to me. I was born Christmas Day, 1868, which makes me, well, how does one count? 38 Christmases passed before I went to sea, and once, one more whilst abroad. How many since then? I cannot say. They have not yet told me the year. Till now, I had not thought to ask. I'm too busy reorganizing, remembering. My father. My father went to war, they tell me, and came home changed. My sisters were years older than I, before, born before he went to soldiering. They said that afterward he stopped talking, worked twice as hard, and often stared at things in the distance. That was the only way I knew him. My mother called me the celebration. When I was young, I thought she meant my birth was worth celebrating. Upon adulthood, I counted the dates and construed the rather that it reflected the circumstances of his return and thus my conception. Hmm, what man of offspring dwells on the matings of mother and sire? 
It was a war about skin, cotton too, and the price of shoes, and whether a nation ought to accept the severing of its bonds over internal strifes. I learned these things in school, which now is vague, like a group of desks in a field of fog, blurred voices, and a chalkboard just beyond sight. The war about skin I remember because my father spoke of it as we returned from the burial of my mother. It was 1880, I was 12. She'd sliced her thumb, butchering uncooked pork, and the infection carried her off. On the way home from the graveyard, my father began to speak and had never heard him utter so many consecutive sentences. Although we just left the burial and the subject was war, still I felt giddy with the intimacy of his revelations. Antietam, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, the sound a ball made as it rifled past your ear, the way a body resisted when you thrust a bayonet and then gave under the blade, the sight calming and frightening both of enemy fires across the field at night. It was, he explained, all he had known until then about death. Useless, he said, because it failed to prepare him to lose a wife. On that single occasion, he spoke of it never after, but once was enough for me to recall all this time. Oh, time, now there is a marvel. Here, on the other side of my mortality, I would like to see Mr. Darwin explain this one. I would like to hear Mr. Edison's theory I would love to hear Wilbur and Orville make a flight of these fancies. So far, the people here and now explain little. They feed me gruel and attach things to me. There are numbers and noises, measurings and masks. They speak curtly and fear the dark. Still, I am in restraints. Canvas holds my wrists and ankles as though I were a, a convict. Hmm. Life's ironies are never subtle. Cold in childhood, I remember that too. Frigid mornings, when the bucket by the stove wore a skin of ice. Dawns in January, when my turn came to light the stove and I blew hard on the reluctant embers. Dressing, whilst still in bed, was another way to warm. I discovered one morning when the rafters bore layers of rhyme from my upward breath through the night. I walked to school under clear cerulean skies and learned that cold is a particular beauty. Its own brilliance for those who are hardy and wearing wool. Perhaps that is what brought me to adventures, the appreciation of cold. I presumed that because I loved nature, nature loved me. Now I know better. Nature does not know I exist. Nature goes about its affairs. And if I stray from a path in the woods, a bear may eat me. If I die from a cliff, the rocks will tell untroubled truth upon my flesh. And if I go a-sailing, seeking unnamed species in the northern seas, not yet. I am not ready to remember that particular cold quite yet. But what was her name? Her fingers, when stretched wide, reached smaller than my palm. Her voice was high like a cricket, melodic like a wren. The only one I trust here is the first one present at my waking. She comes when the others are gone. She turns down the lights, a pleasure in a room with neither night nor day. She releases my wrists and tells me to unbind my ankles myself so that I may be the agent of my own eventual freedom. I do not comprehend her meaning, but her tone is one I trust. Merely, I bend my knees, enjoy my leg's motion, and hold my own counsel. She insists I am not a prisoner. They want to protect me from illness. The one who seems the boss would not last five minutes in the shoe mills of Lynn. Lynn, Lynn, city of sin, never come out the way you went in. Someone would arrive at work one morning to find a hog-tied foreman's hand in a gear mangled to uselessness, or his necktie noose on the rafter, the poor fellow tiptoe all night for his life's sake, or, on one occasion, his carcass in the vat of tanning chemicals, nose down. Then they would bring the suspect to me, he would confess, and there would be my Solomonic duty, measuring his conduct against its provocation, law versus justice. I am a servant of the former who hoped to achieve the latter. I remember the courtroom, but not the building that held it. What though? What was her name? My wife, goodness, I had a wife. Her name was Joan. It comes back to me directly now, a marvel from some cobwebbed bin of the mind. I hear her voice, 
in a moment of irritation. Distracted by the courts, I have forgotten some chore. The horses need fresh feed. The farrier did not come as scheduled. We are low on coal. But that is not all. There was another side to Joan, which only a husband would know. Any time I reached for her, slid an arm around her waist after supper, or woke in deep night to find our bodies spooned in their bedclothes and my wrists between her breasts, or blinked in the light of a new dawn having awakened with desire, always her reply was the same. I am willing. Always that. She never once refused me. I am willing. I can hear that whispered generosity even now. What a thing, how she gave herself to me, and how ardent her body was with mine till we shined like seals, her understanding and her compassion, and possibly even her pity, all in that one quiet phrase, I am willing. It was a decent home, not grand, gas lights, good chairs in the parlor, a front hall with wide stairs. We sought an honorable life at no one's expense, and that ambition brought us to the threshold of greatness, but not its inner rooms. Perhaps that was what led me to explorations. Vanity and the desire to make a name for posterity. After all, no one remembers a magistrate, however just, no one but drunkards and wife slappers and horse thieves and the unfortunate victims of their deeds. Yet I submit it was not weakness which widened my horizons. It was the power of curiosity, of wanting to know so many great minds in that time were enlarging our sense of the world. Who would not wish to dine at the tables of discovery? Here they make the same claim. Hmm. I listen to them all day, putting around me as though I have no ears. They say I am a first. Not a miracle, because there are scientific explanations, but nonetheless. Thus they measure my body weight and heart speed and arm strength. They draw my blood. I watch it pulse from my body into their glass tubes. They snip my hair into a clear bag. One afternoon, a man went finger to finger, toe to toe, trimming my nails into a little white tin. Meanwhile, I must eat particular foods, void in containers they remove as though sacred, and remain in this tiled room with a long window that looks upon their desks and nothing beyond. They say my name will be known forever. Not yet. Not until I tell them. I have saved that secret for her, the one I trust, since remembering it this morning. Until then, my name is a fist of coal, warmingly silently, while one memory after another tiptoes forward from its chilly hiding place. Yesterday, she promised to tell me where I am, what year it is, and how I came to be alive. I relate to her that these questions in my time could only be answered by God. She laughs, a little melody, and tells me no such luck. She is just a 35-year-old biologist from Ohio. Still, as the day drones along, I cannot wait for the others to leave and her to come. Say what you will about the human spirit. I am but four days awakened in this new world, yet already I have preferences. Already I have hopes. I wonder what has become of precious Lynn now. Wait, it was not precious to me. I preferred Boston. Lynn was Joan's home. When she consented to marry me, it was with the understanding that we remained near her mother and brothers. A chilly crew they were, every one, but her father had died in the war between the states. Thus, Lynn was her sanctuary. Hmm. Now I recollect that she was older than me, my Joan, by six years. And while my sisters snickered and implied, I felt it no compromise. Joan had dignity and a generous way before I knew about her willingness. Age explained why we only had the one child, girl's name, though, her name. Here and now, they are quieting for the evening. People work oddly in this time. Instead of performing tasks together, they sit each in his own place, staring at a square of light, speaking into a flat cone, and rarely addressing one another at all. I see little caring between them. The rather, they sneer like children behind one another's backs. They bicker like chickens. At day's end, in the courthouse, there was a hush, as in a library, and a feeling that something had happened in which we all took part. People came to us with their conflicts, their enmities and betrayals, and we sought by inches to make sense of it all. It was solemn, and often I walked home under the weight of responsibility. Here and now, for people who claim to stand on a frontier of humanity, they strike me as uniformly joyless. 
At a fixed hour, they darken their squares of light. They push chairs in against their desks or leave them indifferently askew. They grunt good boy, goodbyes. Clearly, I'm missing something because they seem exhausted by their labors, though mostly what they did was sit. And then she comes, the only one to tell me her name, the one who neither complains of her tasks nor troubles her fellows. She carries a notebook. She has shown me the words she writes there, a neat and minuscule script. I've learned much from her already. There is a thing called blood pressure. It measures the energy with which the heart pumps vital fluid through the body. Edison's inventions, which transformed the humble shoemakers of Lynn into factories of mass production, also led to the lights that hum overhead. Apparently, the workers here tolerate their insufferable boss because he alone had the capacity to bring this enterprise together and thereby coax me back into wakefulness. They are all in his debt. So, I suppose, am I. Tonight she is late, but I do not worry. I know she waits till the others have gone. She says a machine in the other room records all that we say and do, just as court clerks of my time would mark down every syllable of testimony as though it were scripture. People all over the globe see these recordings through squares of light like the ones in this office. She has explained these concepts several times and I still do not comprehend. When I am strong enough to withstand the germs that outside people carry, she has promised to bring me into the other room and show me. I do not understand this concern about the germs. Is the world that drastically changed from when I was first alive? Is the air so different? At last, she arrives. One remaining scientist comes and goes, busy with tasks. She tosses things on a desk, then hurries to start various machineries. She moves with feline grace. No one notices. Oh, I misspeak. During the day, one person has noticed, the heavyset man who writes down everything that everyone says. I know his kind. I was a judge for eight years, then participant in a celebrated Arctic voyage. I recognize a reporter when I see one. Midway, th midway through her tasks, she hangs her back at jacket on the back of a chair. I spy a glistening on the shoulders. Ha, it is winter. There are still seasons. Longing swells in my chest. There is a world outside in which snow falls in the evening. I cannot wait to see it, smell it, feel the cold on my face like the touch of familiar fingertips. A memory appears then, complete like a jewel. An evening, when I returned home late from court, hoping that the little girl would still be awake, I'm striding up the last hill toward home, scent of supper in the chilly air. It is December, a few flakes falling, the fat ones that melt upon landing. All the way home, I've been preoccupied with the case before me, a procedural knot I must somehow untie. When I see the gas lights out front, I realize I've forgotten to put something in my pocket. I feel a minor panic. There are four buttons on my vest. I never use the bottom one. I clasp it firmly, knowing that if Joan discovers this deed, I am certain to hear her voice of disapproval and yet yank that button free. The fabric thankfully does not tear. I pick the remaining threads away. The vest appears as new. Tucking the button in my pocket as I march up the walk and lo, the little one is not inside ready for bed. She is outside, waiting for me in her red wool coat and runs to greet me as though out of a dim corner of the mind. Her shoes slap on the stones. I remember my delight as if it were just this moment. I squat down to embrace her she burrows against me like some wonderful animal. Her tiny hand digs in my pocket and her chilly little nose pokes right in the middle of my cheek. Agnes, her name was Agnes. My daughter, Agnes. The woman from now rushes into my chamber before I can hide my tears.